Hi listeners, I'm Izzy, my pronouns are they and them. Welcome to the Critical Conversations for Social Work podcast. This is Joella. Before we start, we'd like to acknowledge the country that we're recording this episode on today and pay our respects to the Turrbal and Yagara peoples and their elders, past, present and emerging by committing to always remembering that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to the premiere episode of the Critical Conversations in Social Work podcast. My name is Bo and I'll be your host for today. Before we start, I want to first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am on, the Yagara and Turrbal people, and pay my respects to their laws, customs and ownership. Today I'm here with Jean Carruthers, a lecturer at QUT, and surprisingly she is also my supervisor for this placement. And today we're going to be talking about the vision and development of the podcast. How are you, Jean? I'm good, Bo. How are you going? I'm pretty good. How's your day been? Not too bad. It's been a busy day, I have to say. Before I speak further, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the First Nations people of the Turrbal and Yuggera um, country, which is the land that we're on today. Um, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. And just to acknowledge that this land is unceded. Um, And when I say that, it it means that the land hasn't been signed over um, by the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And so therefore it is a colonised country. So back to you, Bo. Thank you, Jean. Uh, So to just open up uh, the conversation into our vision and to, you know, uh, let the uh, audience in, our vision is to deliver a podcast that features an alternative perspective accessible for critical social work education and practice through the sharing of knowledge on critical and creative pedagogy. Now, I know what you're thinking. It may be a little too wordy, but we're Mm going to dissect it in a bit. Uh, So first, uh, Jean, uh, what does critical... Uh, critical and creative pedagogy mean to you? Okay, so I might start with just um, giving a bit of an explanation of what pedagogy is. So when we talk about pedagogy, it's just really a fancy name for learning and teaching or a process of education that can be used in both education spaces but also in practice spaces. So pedagogy is sort of the education process that we might bring to our, um, for me as a lecturer, to my my practice as an educator or to practice in social work. Um, When you bring the ideas of critical and creative pedagogy, so the critical and creative is about bringing approaches to education and practice that have social justice central to the aims of that approach. It's also a way to think critically about our own practice and share these ideas creatively um, in the ways that we either educate students or in the ways that we might practice with people. So bringing those critical understandings and awareness of sort of the broader social, um, political, historical, um, cultural structures in society and how they privilege some and disadvantage others. So it's really what we would say is a counter-hegemonic approach, which means that it draws on alternative knowledges. So it would prioritise critical understandings like critical theories and critical pedagogy, but it would also draw on sort of more artistic or the arts, um, more performative approaches in that creative space and also alternative knowledges such as Indigenous knowledges and whether that be Indigenous knowledges from Australia or other countries, it's about drawing on alternatives to the dominant ideas or the dominant discourses in society or mainstream. Does that kind of answer that for you? Yeah, thank you. It definitely does clear it up. I heard you mentioned uh, counter-hegemonic in your description. Could you just tell me a little bit more about that? 
So when we talk about counter-hegemonic, it means that we're recognising that mainstream approaches in society, so what we would call the dominant discourse, privilege those that are in power. And so when we talk about that, we might talk about white, Western, male as people and sort of identities that are privileged in society and that disadvantage people from diverse backgrounds. And so therefore, we want to not work from that space. We want to actually counter that. And actually, in our podcast, we are intentionally looking to seek not to come from a dominant approach and instead prioritising raising awareness of alternative approaches that are more emancipatory. And when I say emancipatory, another big word, I'm talking about not coming from a place where we are oppressing people. So coming from a place that's more equitable. So being counter-hegemonic in our approaches to pedagogy, but also bringing that by thinking creatively is what this podcast is kind of about, I suppose, and what we've been developing together, Bo, with the other students on placement as well. So I think that sort of gives a bit of an insight into like what we're trying to do. But that really has been an approach that we've tried to use when we're developing the podcast as well. Tricky, but it's something that we sort of have all been passionate about once we learn more about critical and creative pedagogies and how to counter um, the hegemonic and dominant discourses in society. So, you know, speaking of counter hegemonic and the development of the podcast, do you want to talk about the development of the podcast more? Because there was there was nothing homogenic about, uh, you know, the actual development. Uh, and so, you know, I'm just, just for the audience. Well, I'm just wondering, do you want to? Would you like to talk a little bit more about the development of the podcast <laughs> yeah, like from, <laughs> from a student perspective, for example? I would love to. This, this was an experience and a half, definitely. We had two phases to this kind of, uh, to the development. Uh, the first phase was, you know, gathering information, researching about podcasts and about critical and creative pedagogy. And it essentially was building a foundation. And our second phase uh, was essentially establishing the vision, values, and branding of the podcast. So, you know, kind of speaking on my experience, I think the kind of development of this podcast was really different for me because, you know, as a student, I think I've become so used to sitting down, you know, alone doing my work and, you know, I guess kind of developing things alone. Whereas throughout this kind of podcast, it has been really kind of a democratic approach to things, vigorously discussing things between the groups and getting ideas from other people. And yeah. I think you know, it's been really interesting. And even when I had to make the music for the uh, introduction to this podcast, it yeah. was really different and it was really difficult for me because, again, I'm just used to working alone. But with this, I had to take in everyone's preferences and their visions for what the music should sound like. And I think it's really just different. I think it definitely does speak to the counter homogenic kind of stance. You know, Jean, what about you? Yeah, so the things that I remember about the ways that we developed the approach was, one, the music, absolutely. It became a really collaborative approach to understanding what the vision of critical and creative pedagogy was. And I think we took that with us throughout every decision that we made, like does this fit with the vision that we're we're, we're trying to do and with the, the approach to the music I know that would have been more challenging just simply because everyone had such diverse ideas about what the music for this podcast would look like and so it was really great Bo that you had the knowledge that you had and the ability to be able to bring those ideas together and make something magic from that yeah, I think that was really, really wonderful. And there was some really magic moments in uh, the development of the title. That was such a process. And, and we actually gauged that with other people and we sort of looked at the ways that we wanted to make it not too cumbersome, but also really representing what we're trying to do. I think also one of the really good developmental parts of the process was breaking down a lot of the assumptions that we all had about the ways to develop a podcast and 
looking at the ways we do that in a more counter-hegemonic way. So at first it was about that there were a lot of neoliberal ideas and capitalist ideas that came into sort of looking at the ways that we can make it efficient and make it attractive to like a broader audience and sort of started to think about how does that reflect the vision of counter-hegemony and how does that reflect the critical and creative pedagogy that we bring to this process and the collaborative process that we're doing and so we became less about efficiency and getting this done and more about having lots of conversations and dialogue to be able to create this in a meaningful way that really represents what we're trying to create awareness about. One of the great things that I observed was how supportive everybody was of each other in in the ideas that they brought in the times when it was really challenging and there was a lot of uncertainty. I think you're all really backing each other and supporting each other and bringing each other through the process. And it's quite a diverse group. We've got people from many different nationalities. We have people that aren't even in the country. So a couple of the students working with us are in China and lots of different cultural aspects to that so yeah it was a pretty rich experience I have to say. I think in the end you know it was the conversations and our relationships that like kind of really brought it all together and to mm. become what it is today. And the openness to thinking critically yeah, about yeah. what we're doing like everybody was really open to challenging those assumptions in themselves and that's not an easy thing to do and so I thought that was fantastic. So Bo can I just give a little bit of an idea of what this is going to look like beyond this podcast. So as we know, we'll be interviewing different people that actually are using critical and creative pedagogies in social work. And when I say critical and creative, they're creative ways of working in social work, educational practice that have a critical understanding. So that critical and creative is intersectional in that. We're not looking at more conservative ways of working that are creative. All of this is on that foundation of social justice. But we're doing interviews with lots of amazing people that are doing this work and that we don't know about. And so I know that we've got a lineup of interviews with educators for our first, I think it's six episodes. And then after that, we will be looking at working with another group of students and doing interviews with people who are doing critical and creative practice in social work in the field. One of the things that I didn't mention before that I think is really relevant to the critical approach that we're bringing and the breaking down of power barriers is that all of the interviews are actually facilitated by students, which is really exciting. And I think that's great. And Bo, you're leading the way because you've done the first one. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that little like sneak peek. As as more of like a sneak peek of what's to come in the podcast. Jean, do you want to take us through your pedagogy for a bit? Okay, so my pedagogy that I use in practice, and I've used this in social work practice in community education, but I use it also in my education practice as a lecturer at QUT. It's called critical performance pedagogy. And it is something that was kind of born out of my PhD. It is the title critical performance pedagogy was here before. So it comes from political studies, Dwight Conkergood's work, and, <laughs> and also from the autoethnographic work of Norman Denzen. Uh, in research. So critical performance pedagogy has been used and the foundation of it has come from those places. Critical performance pedagogy in social work also draws on arts and collaboration. And so it's recognising the value of Augusta Boal's work in theatre of the oppressed and applied theatre, and also looking at the ways that we can work collaboratively to make social work knowledge and skills accessible in the field. And so it might be looking at the ways that we collaborate to mobilise for social action, for example, or we collaborate as a multidisciplinary team. And so that all is part of the ways that we use critical ideas or critical theory um, and critical pedagogy with performance or performative approaches like a play, for example, and also looking at the ways that people collaborate together to develop those processes of learning and teaching. 
uh, as soon as you mentioned, you know, a play as a as a natural creative myself, uh, my ears naturally gravitate uh, gravitated towards that. So could you could you like you know tell me more about this? Okay, so when we do, um, there's a performance assessment that we use, and uh, I use that in my education practice, and so do some of my colleagues. It's a performance play that students develop, and they do it with their whole tutorial group. Okay, so the whole tutorial group works collaboratively together to develop a play, but the play is used for them to explore the ways that they link theory to practice or what we would call critical praxis. And critical praxis is where you're linking theory to practice by thinking critically about the ways that you would use theory according to a case study. So students develop a case study. They then develop a play around that case study. And the play is around a existing narrative. When I say an existing narrative, it's like something that you've heard before. It could be like a fairy tale, like Alice in Wonderland, for example, or a game show or a reality TV show. Like I know we've had things like Survivor. And what they do is the theories become characters in the play. And so if it was Alice in Wonderland um, and it's the Mad Hatter's Tea Party, there might be like the uh, anti-oppressive theory might be the Mad Hatter, but a more conservative theory like psychodynamic theory might be the Queen of Hearts. And so they're bringing an embodied experience of these theories and thinking critically about the way that they would use them according to the case study. And in this case study, I think Alice in Wonderland, for example, is a homeless person in a domestically violent family situation. And so she has fleed home. Uh, She's a young person. She's done some got in with a, a crowd of people who have taken her in, but they're doing sort of criminal activities and she's drinking a lot. So it's looking at the ways that the different theories might approach that case scenario and approach that situation. And so students develop the play in their tutorial group. So they're using their collaboration knowledge and skills that they would use in social work. And then they perform the play to the rest of the cohort of students. So they're sharing the knowledge which is sharing the knowledge as part of critical pedagogy in relation to the ways that they think critically about the approaches that they bring to practice. And sharing that with the rest of the cohort allows them to have a new perspective uh, or a more grounded perspective according to the ways that that might they might be able to receive that information because it's entertaining as well. Yeah, it sounds really interesting. And, you know, it really does sound like critical and creative pedagogy in a way, you know, in the way yeah. that it deconstructs, you know, certain uh, structures and stuff. The, my last question to you is what brought you into this pedagogy? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So probably as I was growing up as a kid, I always loved dance. Dance was probably my first love and drama and things like that. And so uh, creative traditions or the arts was really prominent in uh, the ways that I grew up and they were things that I really loved. And when I was working in a university, I became friends with um, some of the drama lecturers that I was working alongside and so I ended up um, they told me about applied theatre and process drama and theatre of the oppressed and I became really really uh, enthusiastic about the ways that I could bring those ideas to my social work practice and bring those ideas to my the ways that I taught social work Um, at the university in my tutorials. And so that's where that idea came from. I can't say that the performance assessment idea was mine. It actually came from my discipline lead who thought up that idea. And because of my interest, I ran with that. And that's how it became part of my PhD. But the ways that I have used it in practice, so I did some study in uh, process drama and applied theatre and theatre of the oppressed. And I developed a play, it was a forum theatre play. And forum theatre is where you develop a play 
and it tells a particular story, but the story is a story of something bad that's happened kind of thing, something it's, a, it's an unfortunate story and the audience gets to interact with that and actually try to change the story for a better outcome for the person who is oppressed in the story right and so I did some and I could see how that would be really good uh, in my in my work as a sexual assault counsellor and so I was looking at community education and, and using it in schools I developed that play and then we got drama students to come together to sort of create the actual play and then I used that um, and it was a play about sexting so it's a play about the ways that people are pressured to send nude photos of themselves and things like that. And so we we actually developed this play and I had the support of the drama lecturer that I used to work with. And it was amazing. And the students at schools, um, I think they were year nine students that we worked with, really were able to think about the ways that they could actually change the culture of sexting and change the story within that performance. And so for me, that was a form of critical performance pedagogy because it was about bringing critical ideas and bringing a social justice understanding to the pressures that young people have around sexting and actually them being part of that democratic process of social change and then being invested and involved in that. And it was a re- what we call a rehearsal for res- revolution. So it's a rehearsal for social change, but we don't know what they take away with them and what confidence and reassurance that that might have given them if they were exposed to that or if they had already been exposed to that and how that sort of reinforced for them that they weren't wrong. It's just a, a, a crappy thing that happens in our society and it's created by those dominant discourses and dominant understandings and and the pressure on young people and all of those things that that come with that situation. So, So looking at the ways that pedagogy can be used to raise awareness about social issues in social work. And there you have it, folks, you know, drama and uh, social work. Who said, you know, (laughs) this can't be fun? (laughs) So, yeah. So thank you, Bo. I just wanted to say thank you. And it's been amazing working with you around developing this podcast. Yeah, it was great chatting with you. So uh, I just want to thank our audience for listening. And thank you, Jean, for, you know, being here and discussing it with me. Uh, And, you know, without further ado, I think, you know, it's over. Thank you. Wonderful. See you later. you'd like to keep up with any of our socials and to continue listening to future episodes please follow us on instagram that's critical conversations the number four sw